I know many of you listening are at least somewhat interested in hooves, so I wanted to make sure you all knew about the upcoming Progressive Hoof Care Practitioners Conference on October 6th through 9th, 2022 in Denver, Colorado. We are super excited to put together a conference where we can hear from various speakers, including Dr. Bob Bowker, Dr. Thomas Teske, Monique Craig, Carol Layton, James Shaw, and Dr. Lisa Lancaster about everything from hoof pathology, biomechanics, how nutrition affects the hoof, and the connection between teeth and feet and more. It is also a great time to connect with horse owners and hoof care providers from around the world. You'll likely get to meet me and even a lot of the guests who have been on the podcast as well and put a face to a voice. If you are interested in attending, check out progressivehoofcare.org slash conference. If you have an equine related business and are interested in hosting a table in our trade show, which includes conference admission, email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com. Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. Some of you may remember back in August 2021 when I did a podcast interview with Sarah Hunt, a hoof care provider based out of Southern California who has a hoof boot fitting business as well. We talked all about hoof boots and when and how to use them. We always said we would do another episode and we just kept struggling with making our schedules align enough to work out an interview time until now. In this episode with Sarah, we talk about tips and tricks for boots for hard to fit horses. How do you get boots to stay on a horse whose feet just don't fit the mold? What's the best way to break in boots to prevent rubbing? Sarah dives into all of that and more. I just want to thank you so much for being willing to do this again, because I know that you've given so much of your time, like you've just volunteered your time to help people learn more about boot fitting. And I know that that's an expertise of yours. So I really appreciate you being willing to come on the podcast for a second time and do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking that we could focus this episode more on the issues with boots and particularly riding boots, because I feel like that is one of the biggest objections I get to owners using boots for protection is worrying about fit or if they're going to fall off or if they're going to twist or if they're going to rub. And so I thought that having a conversation about those issues might help kind of, you know, lessen the anxiety about all those things. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that's a a common thing that we get is we're talking about health protection is, you know, people go, well, you know, I don't want to do shoes, but you know, what do I do? Because my horse you know, needs something that I try to ride on rocks or I live uh, someplace where the horse has to walk through gravel to get, you know, from point A to point B, or I go to shows and we have issues. And, you know, there's all kinds of, of questions and concerns that come up with, with hoof boots. And, you know, the great thing about hoof boots is we have a ton of variety, but the problem is that they're all really designed around a really healthy foot. And the thing is, is that, the horses with really healthy feet are the ones to not need them, most likely. <laughs> right. And so we get these horses who are coming out of rehab or just pulled their shoes and their feet aren't in too bad a shape, but they need some help when they do something. And they're the ones that need the boots the most and are the t- toughest to fit and are the most likely to have issues, you know, with boots tw- twisting or rubbing or not fitting over a whole trim cycle or, you know, whatever, whatever the problem is. And so, that's when we have to sort of get creative. And like for me with my practice and my boot business, you know, I make it a real point. You know, I am a rep for four different companies, you know, Easy Care, Scoot, Cavallo, Equine Fusion. I'll work with just about anything. I'll help you measure it, we'll problem solve and figure it out. And, you know, I do offer a fit guarantee for the boots that I fit in person. So, you know, very often, I'm out there again, you know, a few weeks later, we're figuring out, okay, what accessories do we need to add? You know, is this boot going to work? Or, hey, you know, this size is technically correct, but it's not fitting. <laughs> and so we're going to need to go, you know, like I, I just did this yesterday. I have a horse who, you know, um, I first put him in my demo size of a 13 slim equine fusion, which to borrow while he kind of got through his first couple of trims. And then we got him the right size, which was a 12 regular. And the 12 regulars are spinning and they're you know, starting to rub a little bit after a few weeks. He's in a, most of the time, he's a, a rehab case. And we put him back in the 13 slims and all the problems went away. Now, they're too long, but 
there's no problems with them. And he's just hanging out in a stall in a turnout, not doing much. So it's not a problem. So sometimes you have to go outside of the box and outside of the what should work situations and get creative. And especially with rehabbing or a horse who needs pads in the boots, things like that, that, that affects boot fit. And so what seems to fit without the added accessories sometimes won't fit with added accessories. Yeah. So sometimes you have to just sit there and scratch your head and go, okay, well, um, now what? <laughs> yeah. And figure out, yeah. And, and it really looks to figuring out, okay, you know, were you fine for four weeks and now it's the fifth and sixth week before the trim and now you're rubbing? So is the issue the boot or is it the foot? Has the foot gotten too long now because the horse tends to run forward with long toes and so now the heel bulbs are getting rubbed because the boot is getting pulled forward too far. And so the solution there would be either shortening the trim cycle or teaching the owner to roll the toe back. Getting in there and really figuring out, okay, you know, what is the issue here? What's causing the issue? Is it the boot? Is it the foot of the boot? Is it the foot itself? Is it, you know, did we, okay, now that the horse is sound enough to work more, have we changed the kind of riding that we're doing? And so now this style of boot is just going to be problematic because, you know, the horse is going through a lot more water and this is a boot that comes up above the hairline. And so now we're getting, you know, a damp foot that is getting rubbed by the boot. And so we need to switch to a boot that is a lower profile. The questions can sort of be a little bit daunting sometimes when you're not familiar with a wide variety of boots. Right. And you kind of dived into this a little bit, but what are some of the most common problems that you see when it comes to riding boots? So, you know, obviously boot retention, they come off, <laughs> um, it, you know, it doesn't matter how wonderful your boots are. Um, if they come off, they're not doing you any good. So getting ones that fit well enough that they're going to stay put, but not obviously fit so tightly that they're going to cause rubs. Also though, ironically, by the same token, a lot of boots, if they fit too tightly are more likely to come off. And I know that's sort of a Think about it and blink for a minute situation. But um, Pete Ramey likes to describe it with easy boot gloves that they want to squirt off the foot. Right. Um, you can kind of think about it. You know, if you jam something that's too tight onto something and it'll stay there for a minute, but as soon as any sort of force shifts the boot, it's going to pop off the entire way, not just shift a little bit. Renegades, for example, if you have twisting issues with renegades, it's probably because you have them fastened too tightly or they're too small. How renegades work is they need, with that cable system and heel captivator, they need to be able to have a little bit of play in there so that when your horse moves, they can shift one way and then shift back. And then they have a little bit of give side to side for that heel captivator to stay stable on the foot. And so if you take that give out of the cable system, and the boot's going to shift one way and it can't shift back. So it's going to keep shifting and keep shifting and keep shifting. And then it's going to spin. So, you know, I'll fit clients in renegades from here, here and there. And uh, they'll call me and go, well, they're, they're twisting. Okay, how tight are you putting them? Remember, we talked about this. Make sure you have a little, little bit of play in there. And they loosen them up you know, an eighth of an inch and voila, stops being a problem. So boots that are too tight often as much of a retention problem as boots that are too loose. So it's it's really kind of that Goldilocks thing, or a Cinderella, I suppose, the last slipper. Getting them fit just so. Other issues, you know, okay, the boot stays on, but it rubs. You know, the bulkier the boot you have, the higher it comes up over the foot, over the hairline, the more soft tissue that it covers, the more opportunity we have for rubbing, obviously. Rubbing on the hoof wall itself, if it's down below the coronet, really isn't that big of a deal. A lot of folks wouldn't even notice it, except that a lot of trimmers leave the periopal, that protective outer covering on the hoof wall instead of dressing it back. And so it's just that being rubbed off. Um, I'll get a few pictures sent to me from clients. Oh, it's rubbing the wall. And this is, it's, it's taken off that outer covering, but it, it's not actually doing any damage to the wall. And then, you know, just little things, you know, boot issues can be stuff like, you know, straps are breaking or if you ride in areas that are real grassy and you've got velcro on your boots you can get full of fox tails and stuff like that which is just annoying and then the velcro doesn't stick anymore and then they come off because the velcro came undone you know it's it's every boot has its downside there is no perfect boot i obviously have my personal boot preferences but there's always an if or a but as to why it might not work for a particular situation yeah and 
And kind of along that same vein, because obviously this is the other side of the issue, is what what hoof issues or what horses do you see that you find are the hardest to fit? Mm, yeah. Probably universally the hardest to fit are horses who are really high heeled or club footed because all of these boots are made for horses with fairly low heels. And a real low heeled horse, we can pad up to lift up higher in the boot. But if we have a club footed horse who's real happy with his heel height, we can't really take it down. However, I, I've had luck with that recently with the new Glove 50 from Easy Care. This is an newer one on the market. It's based on the same glove shell as the Easy Boot Glove, which is a fantastic boot. But the Glove 50 has a retention system and a gator that's more like the Easy Boot Fury. And what I've actually done for a club foot client of mine is I, I've added a little extension to that gator so that it doesn't fasten to the boot directly, I, I cut out a piece of power strip so that we lifted up the gator by about half an inch or so. And she has put so many miles on those boots. This horse is, he is a, a trail monster. They go out for 20, 20 and a half miles at a time on crazy terrain and she has not lost a boot and he loves them. So I think that with a little more finessing of that, uh, that boot model, it's got a couple little tweaks still because it's new, but that could be a really great option for our folks. And do you see horses that have, okay, so I'm thinking about my own personal horse that I lease and he doesn't have the straightest conformation in the world and has like Mm -hmm. a little bit of twisty movement. And do you see horses have difficulty with boot retention when they have a little bit more like twist in their biomechanics as you know, in the, like it throughout the phase of the stride. And do you have any tips for helping keep boots on, on that kind of movement? Really good question. What I probably would do when faced with that, I would probably choose a boot that allows for some give and take. So like a scoop boot, for example, you know, we have that open front that closes with the straps. And so you have the ability for the boot to kind of stretch and torque a little bit and then return to where it should be. And so doing that, and you might need a a mud strap just to make sure that you really keep it on there in case the horse really scrambles over something on trail, for example. Having that combination allows the boot to distort with a twisty movement foot and then come back to where it should be. A renegade might work well for that situation. Again, it has that play and give and take, but I have seen it also be a little bit of an issue for a horse like that who had a real twisty movement behind. He had a set of renegades that worked well and then he needed a replacement and we couldn't get that pair to work. So I don't know if maybe it was just a slight difference in one of the boot shells, or I think the first pair had been used. So maybe they were broken in differently by a different horse. That's a whole nother can of worms. Used boots are, they can be fantastic, but you have to take them as individuals. They're no longer a certain size. They're like a size and a quarter (laughs) because they've been broken in by somebody else. So if you're, if you're having problems with boots and you bought them used, that could well be the issue. Go find something new. And and go from there. Anyway, back off that tangent. So yeah, twisty movement can be a little bit of a challenge. But usually it's not one that we have too much of an issue with once we get a boot that fits really nice. Hind feet can be trickier to fit twisty movements with because hind feet can be trickier to fit in the first place, given they're more of a spade shape and they're narrower. And so... Certain companies have made slims, like Scoot Boot has the slim scoots, and those work well for hind feet usually. Although, honestly, I fit the majority of my clients in slim sizing in scoots because the scoot does have that capacity to stretch at the end of the cycle. And most horses don't have a round enough foot, frankly, to really take advantage of the snugness that a scoot can offer when it's really on there good because it does have those low down side slots which will allow for a little bit of extra growth at the end of the cycle to peak out. And that's kind of a unique thing to the scoot itself. But yeah, so twisting hind feet is more of an issue than twisty front feet, I think, is the end of that, that question. Yeah, um, and I have had, heard people complain about that too with hind boots, having boots come off. Like I have some friends who have gated horses who say that you know, mm. they have so much trouble keeping hind boots on them. Mm-hmm. I very often fit my gated horses in scoop boots with mud straps and I fit him snug, you know, and if it's an issue with the owner, I just say, look, you're just going to have to learn how to roll the toe back at three weeks to make sure that your boots stay on real good. And sometimes we'll throw bell boots on over the top. But usually that combination works pretty well. 
-hmm. So obviously, you know, we're talking about finding the perfect fit for, you know, a certain horse's foot. How can you tell if the boot is fitting well just looking at it? (laughs) (laughs) So that does somewhat depend on them. Some of them you can tell by looking at them, but a lot of them, it's a feel for me. And that might just be because I've fit so many boots over the years, but you know, the things we check for. So on an easy boot glove, for example, we want to see a little bit of widening of that V slot in the front. Not too much. If you have too much widening, then chances are the boots too small and it's going to try and pop off whenever it can. But with the glove, we want it to sort of pop on the foot real nice. And once you put a glove shell on a foot that fits correctly. You kind of get this very satisfying little like, it'll just slide on there and it sinks in over the heel and the toe pockets in real nice. And you you can feel, okay, this boot is not going to want to go. You know, people do take their horses to shows with glove shells and just taped on and they can do a flat class without a gator because their shells fit so, you know, so A glove shell, it sits on there nicely, and you've got a little bit of widening of that V at the front of the boot. A scoot boot, it gets on there. We see maybe a stretch, a a tiny bit of widening, like tiny, tiny bit of widening. The front opening where that uh, those toe straps close over. We have a nice flush fit along the sides, and we've got room for a finger uh, or a finger and a half over the heel bulbs under those bulb straps. For a renegade, you know, it sits on there nice. It doesn't want to twist a little bit, or it doesn't want to twist a lot. It's got a little bit of shift, perhaps, but it wants to stay nice and center. You know, basically, the, the, the kind of parameters you look for, while they are a little different based on the boot you're working with, you know, we want a toe that sits in there and sits nice. It's up against the front of the boot, and it's set in there nicely. Now we want a heel that is down all the way in the base of the boot, heel bulbs that are not being smashed up against the back of the boot, you know, touching, sure, but not crammed in there. Ideally, we want a nice full fit through the whole sides of the foot as well. Depending on the model, if you've got a narrow foot, then, you know, certain models are more accommodating of a little more of a gap. It's just like when you're fitting your own shoes, you know, your own hiking boots. Think about that. You know, you would you want to pull that hiking boot on your own foot and feel your heel just sink in there and be secure. You don't want your heel to be loose and slipping around in the back of your hiking boot. You want to feel the lacing over the top of your foot to be secure, but not too tight to where it's going to cause pressure. You want to have a comfortable amount of space, but not be loose at the front of your shoe, right? When you lace up through the ankle, again, you want to feel it snug and comfortable, but not too tight or you can't have full range of motion. Does that all make sense? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there are times when I go and fit a horse and we try traditional pairs of boots on before we find something that works, you know, even though it looks like it should be fine or it measures correctly or what have you, and you put it on there and you just go, that's just not going to work. Or we know by how this particular horse grows or how this particular horse wears that, you know, they are pigeon toed and so their breakover wears to the outside and by the fourth or fifth week of the cycle they've got this weird squared off medial toe and that's a really hard one to deal with honestly that's usually one where i tell the owner you're going to have to roll the toe back to get a good boot fit past a certain point because no boot is square on the inside (laughs) um they're, they're all around so Anyway, we may have wandered off a little bit of that question, but yeah, basically the long and the short of it is when you know you've got a good boot fit, you know, the boot is nice and settled on that foot. It doesn't want to move a whole lot. It's stable. It's not hard to fasten. Now, it might not be easy to fasten depending on the model, but it's not too easy or too hard to fasten. It fastens up and you can get it done. And when the horse moves off, the horse moves normally and naturally isn't bothered by the boot. The boot isn't shifting or clomping around on the foot. You can't hear a weird echoey sound when they step down and then the boot hits secondarily to the foot. And you can put them on and go on your way and don't have to worry about them. That's realistically when we have a good boot fit is, is, is what happens. Yeah. And, and something yeah. else that sort of can cause issues with boot fit, at least, you know, in clients, horses that I see is the desire to add pads into boots. And 
I have, mm-hmm. I have mm-hmm. a lot of horses mm-hmm. that prefer pads in the boots for, you know, extra protection, extra concussion relief, extra cushion. Um, so what kind of boots do you see accommodating pads well? And a follow-up question to that is, do you size up in the boots? Mm-hmm. So if I'm adding pads, I tend to default to a boot that goes up above the hairline, usually, because whenever you add pads, you know, the pad can twist on the bottom of the boot. The pad can help the foot be more slippery against the bottom of the boot. You're adding height, and so you're changing the boot fit. So you really, if you intend to use pads, you need to fit your boot with, you can get an idea of, okay, this looks like it's the right size, but let's put a pad in it and see if it's still the right. You may need to go up half a size in a boot, like a glove or from a a scoot, you may need to go up or to a slim or from a slim to a regular or something like that. I don't usually fit boots with pads, actually. What I tend to do is I just tend to choose a boot that has a different sole. So if I have a thin soled horse who's sore on a lot of terrain, I won't fit him in a scoot because the scoot sole is thin and flexible. I will try and put them in a glove, or if they're definitely sore over like basically everything, then I'm going to look for an equine fusion. Because the equine fusion, well, A, we can put a thick or thin pad in there, no problem. But B, the equine fusion sole is thick and rubbery and flexible, but it, it takes a lot of the concussion and the soreness from the ground interacting with the sole just out of the equation by itself. I actually also really like the equine fusion dampening pads for horses who uh, are thin sold and just need a little extra help. They're a nice rubbery material that lasts and they're not too thick and they are pretty effective for the horses who seem to like them quite a bit. So I've put the equine fusion pads in other boot models. I've put the easy care pads in other not easy care models. I've put, you know, you you don't have to stick with the same manufacturer pad and boot um, to combine those two, put it that way. So yeah, when you're padding a boot, sometimes you do have to size up. If you're going to be using a pad that's half an inch thick or thicker, well, for one thing, if your horse is that sore footed, you may just need to go to a therapy boot with a cloud pad and get your horse stouter before you really try and do a riding boot, in my opinion. Granted, I live in the land of really hard ground and not any grass. So I know that a lot of people fight with mild laminitis and some soreness due to spring grass or just too much pasture. And that's just not a reality for me because water doesn't exist here. So Mm -hmm. grass doesn't exist either, you know? So not having a lot of the minor laminitic issues due to pasture that I have here, for the most part, when I encounter a sore-footed horse who's thin sold, it's either they've been routinely trimmed aggressively and had that sole all trimmed out just over and over again. And so we just have to stop trimming sole, protect the foot. Or we've got, you know, some other kind of situation where, yes, it was the old diet that was the problem. And you've now changed the diet and gotten them alpha, alpha, alpha and sweet feed and onto a good trace mineral supplement and all of that stuff. And now we just need to wait a little bit and the horse will be able to transition out of a more protective boot to something simple. So I am well aware that I'm very blessed in San Diego to not have a ton of laminitis issues. And that that is something that people deal with routinely in other parts of the country. But yeah, so if you're working with a half inch pad or thicker, then realistically, I think your boot success is going to be limited unless you're working with a boot that really can accommodate a pad that thick. So Easy Boot Cloud, Easy Boot Trail, Equine Fusions, Wallows, something like that that goes up over the hoof entirely and fastens up around the pasture. Thin pads, a quarter inch or six millimeter pads, we can do in an easy boot glove or a scoot. Renegades are tricky to pad because they're completely open at the back. So the pads just slide out. If you know that you want a pad in your Renegade, you can order them with a pour in gel pad from Renegade. That's often a great option if you've got a horse who's just a little bit sensitive, but Renegades work really well for you and you're going to be doing a lot of trail work and you want a real good performance boot like a Renegade, then getting the pour in gel pad option that they last a really long time. It's a fairly firm gel, but it's nice for taking off a little more of that concussion, having a little more depth between the bones and the ground. But yeah, I usually try and also just make my boot choice reflect 
the needs of the horse that I'm working on. So if the horse is thin sold, I'm going to choose a thicker sold boot in order to help compensate for that. And then we'll go from there as far as, okay, is that enough or do we need to add pads? Yeah. And, you know, obviously this is might be a harder question to answer because there's so many possibilities. But mm-hmm. if you have a foot that just won't fit perfectly into any one boot, what are some things that you can try to make sure they're not just flying off at every turn? <laughs> So that kind of wanders into the boot accessories conversation. So, you know, certain boots have added straps or the way that they fasten is already a strap that allows for a lot more security. So like the Easy Boot Glove 50, I mentioned earlier, I'm using on a club foot horse. They really do allow a glove shell that doesn't fit quite as well as we'd like to stay put really good on a foot. So I think that is something I'm going to be utilizing more. So I've routinely run into horses where I've, I'm feeling, you know, a glove shell would be a great choice for this horse. They need a performance boot and the horse is a little bit thin sold. And so we need something that's got a little thicker sole. And, you know, it'd be awesome to be able to give them a glove, but uh, we can't get a good fit with the shell. And the standard glove, you really need a really good fit on the glove shell in order for it to, to be secure. The, the glove soft relies on the fit of the shell, not the gator to stay on. And you can heat fit a glove shell. If you're working with someone who's experienced with heat fitting, or if you would like to, to give it a gamble and, and see what you get, it does take some finesse and practice to get just right. Fitting a glove shell can be, but I do know that in reality, most folks ordering off the internet are not going to have the willingness to do that because it does also uh, keep you from uh, being able to return your boots if they don't fit. And Easy Care is one of the few companies, uh, if I think may possibly be the only company that offers a 45-day satisfaction guarantee on your boots. So you can actually use them and still return. So I think the Glove 50 is going to be really great for those horses that need a thicker sold performance boot, but you can't figure out a different option. The Scoot Boot, and I, I'm focusing on these particular boots because these are the ones that I use most often. There are other great options on the market. Uh, the Explorer Magic, I really am looking forward to getting some more client horses in and, and getting some good experience with those. I've heard a lot of great things about flex boots, but they just don't hold up quite so well in my climate, which is basically everything is concrete, whether it's dirt concrete or concrete concrete, because we're all on DG and clay out here. So it's it's we need boots that are going to hold up to pretty tough terrain. You know, there are tons of great options. So I'm speaking to the ones that I work with every day. So back to accessories, the scoot boots, the mud strap, pretty much if I have a scoot that fits great, but every so often the horse overreaches and yanks it off or goes through mud or is scrambling up nasty rocks and so gets their foot wedged in a rock and has to yank their foot free and the boot comes off. A scoot boot mud strap pretty much solves that. They are a little bit extra work to put. So some folks are a little bit leery about that because "Ah, I have to do this extra strap thing. I have to clean out the little uh, keeper at the end of it so it fits better and da 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 da. But your boot doesn't come off and you're not spending half an hour in the middle of your trail ride trying to find your boot in the bushes. So usually it's a decent exchange in terms of a little bit of extra effort. If we have a boot that we need to sort of bulk up a little bit, you know, we can use shims or we can do something like there's the new scoot endurance gator. It's very similar to a, uh, the easy boot gator that was offered back with the boa boots years ago. And uh, that is really nice to sort of take up a little extra bulk. So sometimes I'll have a horse who's transitioning and, you know, I, he likes to grow long toes and right after a trim for the first week and a half or so, the boot's a little bit too loose. Okay, so pop the endurance gator in, use that for the first week or two, uh, and then stop using it when the boots start fitting a little bit better as the cycle goes on. You know, sometimes we have just little things that we add in there. Pads also can be used for that as well. They can snug up boot fit just a little bit and then once the boot is fitting a little bit better as the cycle goes on take your so we have options whether it's choosing a boot that has a more robust fastening system in the first place or using an accessory that snugs everything up and keeps the boot really stable on the foot so yeah if boot retention is an issue 
there's almost always a boot choice or accessory to choose that can help resolve that. It's just a matter of making sure that when you are choosing what boot to use, that you're really taking a look at how that boot fits your horse and what kind of riding you do and what you're going to be asking of that boot. Yeah. And I mean, all of this is so great. This is stuff that I need to learn more about myself too, just practicing it and making sure that I, you know, I'm really understanding how to keep boots on horses' feet because that's one of the most frustrating things. And I think it's why a lot of people either give up on barefoot or don't continue or, or don't pursue barefoot because they're worried about that. And I think, I mean, that those are all the main questions I had in terms of like tips and tricks for boot fit. I don't know if you have any like, you know, topics that we didn't address that we wanted to go over now, or if you have any like parting advice for horse owners that are working through frustrating boot issues. So yeah, I, you know, I always like to just go over some general things with everybody when, they, when they're when they getting used to their hoof boots and starting out with them. You know, this is sort of my, my general, okay, now that you have hoof boots. So some general suggestions with boots. Some boots are left and right specific. So for example, the Cavallo Simple, the Velcro fastening straps, they're on the outside of the boot. So, so when, and they come in a pair, so they are left and right. Equine Fusion Actives are the same way. The fastening stud is on the outside. So they come in a box with of two and they're left and right. A lot of boots, however, are universal. So they're not dedicated left and right by themselves. So a lot of easy boots, if not all of them are this way. Scoop boots are this way. Renegades. But it's still best to keep a left and a right because your horse moves differently on the left and right foot. They're going to put a different wear pattern in. Each foot is shaped a little bit differently. So it's always good to figure out a way to mark the lefts and rights. You can put a little bit of nail polish on there. I often just have my clients just mark the left one because left is easy to draw with a little nail, pol- nail polish brush or permanent marker or something. Sometimes with easy boot gloves, I'll just nip a teeny corner off that uh, top V in the front. So we'll just n- n- nip a little side off one of those so that you can see, oh, it's going to point to the outside. You know, There's different ways you can do it, whatever works for you, but it's good to keep a left and a right. For some, the boot straps can be reversed so that the open end of the, the strap points outward which is also useful for preventing that end to be uh, pulled open if it's caught by the other foot. So uh, renegades, for example, you can reverse the Velcro strap so that you have them pointing outwards and then that keeps them from being pulled open while the horse is traveling. And it also helps point which direction is left and right for you. Also, if the strap has a keeper, use it. I know sometimes it's an extra 30 seconds of shoving things in keepers and you're in a hurry to get back and to meet up with your trail riding friends and, oh, I just want to be done with it. Well, an extra 30 seconds putting your boot on correctly is going to save you quite a bit of time trying to find your boot if it comes off in brush. So I usually recommend just, just, especially with tough terrain, take the extra time double check your boots, make sure everything is on. Avoiding basic problems. These are all pretty universal here. Uh, Keep your boots clean, rinse them or brush them out real good after you use them. Uh, Store them indoors, out of the sun. UV light is absolute hell on plastics. And all these boots are some variety of plastic. And UV will just break your boots down so much faster. Sunlight is really hard on them, so keep them inside. Many boots have replaceable parts, gaiters, straps, clips, a whole bunch of things like that. Typically, those are replaceable. So you really can often extend the life of your boot by just replacing parts as you need to and not having to buy a whole new boot. Usually, when you need to completely replace a boot is when you've just worn it through the sole entirely. With Renegades, you can order a new shell. You can get a new gaiter for gloves, or you can get a new shell. A lot of boots, you can replace all the individual parts. Check your screws regularly. If you've got screws on your boots, they they will work loose over time. Some companies Loctite them at the factory. And so you're not going to get those undone without a whole lot of work. Some companies don't. So check them, make sure they're tight. If you have one that keeps wanting to work loose on you, you can Loctite it or nail polish is actually a really easy way to uh, get something that's secure, but it's easier to open than Loctite. Uh, just to back the screw out. Don't have to back it out all the way. Just back it out most of the way. Paint the, 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 the threads with some nail polish. And certain models do need more maintenance than others and kind of demand a little bit 
higher do-it-yourself ishness so the ones that have replaceable cables and things like that you kind of have to get familiar with um, all of those moving parts versus just a strap that screws on the types of things i usually recommend having around you know similar to your horse first aid kit this is sort of your boot first aid kit especially if you're going camping or traveling with your boots and then something breaks and you go okay now what mole foam or eva foam tape so mole foam is very much like mole skin that you get from the drugstore for blisters on your own feet should be in the same section. It's a very thin foam with a sticky side. Athletic tape, such as Mueller tape or scary sticky goat tape, which is a, actually a crossfit tape, but works really well. The adhesive sticks well to the wall and it, as it heats up from the heat of the foot, it permeates through the other side of the tape and then to your boot and it will help stick everything on there really good. So that's a common trick for folks who are putting a lot of miles on gloves is they'll put a few loops of tape over the foot and then put the glove on. And that keeps those boots really secure. Duct tape, always good. You know, Gorilla Tape is going to be probably your longest lasting duct tape. But even the less expensive stuff can be handy. You know, if you're in a bind and you're starting to get a rub and you need those boots, you can carefully put a, a little square of duct tape over a spot that's getting a little bit of a rub. Not if it's open wound in the whole bit, but if it's just you're noticing the hair is going kind of situation. I, I have had good luck with just gently putting a little square duct tape or a strip over the heel bulbs in general to have the boot start sliding over the tape instead of sliding over the skin. Gold bond powder or baby powder, really great to have in there to help with dryness. If you are having your horse wear the boots for long periods of time in a moist environment, then I like gold bond since it has an antifungal in it. Some variety of ointment in case you get a rub. Cotton balls or gauze squares. Again, this can be for if you're getting a rubbed area or also just a, a generally useful thing to have any replacement straps or screws for your boots so that if you're you know out on trail and you go back to camp and you lose your, your boots breaking you can replace it uh, a screwdriver anything else you would need to fix your boots so a screwdriver and uh, it could be handy to have some sort of pliers just to help keep everything stable while you're working on it uh, a scrub brush keep things clean. And then some variety of spray to help your boots be less funky if they get kind of gross. So like 50-50 apple cider vinegar and water works pretty well just to help fight any fungus that might be happening. And uh, you can spray the foot down with that as well. So those are my usual suggestions and the types of things that you want to have around when you're doing a lot of work with your boots. You know, I have got all the stuff in my trailer. So when I'm out camping or shore riding, I've always got access to anything like that that I might need. Yeah. And one of the last things that I go into with clients when they're buying a pair of boots is discussing how to get started with your boots. You know, if your horse has never worn boots before and you need to break these boots in, you know, a lot of folks go and buy a pair of boots because they're planning on going on a camping trip or someplace where they're going to be doing a lot of trail riding over hard terrain or terrain and they don't know what it's going to be. And so they want to have that extra protection which is fantastic and it's a great use of, of hoof boots uh, versus putting shoes on your horse for a trip. So I am absolutely all for it, but make sure that you do it in enough time to break your boots in first. So again, going back to the hiking boot analogy with people, you know, you wouldn't buy a brand new pair of hiking boots and then immediately go and hike, you know, the Pacific Coast Trail or Appalachian Mountains or something like that. You wouldn't immediately do that. You would break your boots in first. So it's very, get started with your boots with short periods of use, you know, break them in, in the round pen, in the arena, in turnout, you can turn them out for a couple hours at a time, you know, easy, short, flat trails, just get those boots starting to form to your horse's foot and have your horse's feet start to get used to wearing the boots. And then you can start identifying any potential spots of concern for rubbing when they're very minor before they turn into an actual monitor, heel bulbs and pasterns and any other areas that might be of concern based on your particular boot model. Make sure that it doesn't really ever progress past the hair is getting messed up stage. As the boot breaks in and your horse's skin toughens up slightly, a well-fitting boot will not rub, just like with your own shoes. And if your horse does start to rub, it's not because the boot is too small or too big. It could be some folk had to go, oh, well, if it's too small, then it must rub. Well, it, it can be the other way around too. Too much play in the boot can rub if there's just too much space in there for it to move around. Some good tips to help with break-in, you know, using baby powder or gold bond powder. If 
it gets too moist, then obviously the skin is softer and more prone to rubbing. Neoprene gaiters, such as the Scoot Boot Endurance Gaiter, can be used with many boot designs for particularly sensitive horses. You know, some of them, especially really low heel horses, are more prone to be rubbed on the back of the pastern up higher, and the Scoot Boot Endurance Gaiter does come all the way up that high. It uh, has a Velcro strap that goes around the pastern, and it's made of neoprene. So that can be a really great option to help break in the boot. And, and sometimes once the foot is accustomed to a boot and the boot is broken in, you can stop using some of these extra measures. But through break-in, you need to make sure that everything is going well. Tube socks are another option, particularly for horses needing extensive boot wear, like if they're in turnout and they're in rehab boots and so they're in them for you know, 20 some odd hours a day. Socks can work really well and they're less expensive, so you can just keep you know washing them. Wool socks work really well, uh, especially if you're going to have one who is going to be in boots long term. And so it's worth the investment. If the boot is only slightly too big and only slightly, pads or shims can help take up that extra space. Again, if the boot is a little too big and it's shifting too much, it can rub. So shimming the sides often works pretty well to help with that back and forth side to side turning that a, a too big boot can do. If the boot is slightly small, and again, slightly small, whereas you know going up a size is too big, but going down the size is, is, is just it's a bit too small. Rolling the hoof wall and shortening that toe back up a little bit may make a difference, uh, especially if this happens at the end of your trim cycle. So this is a fairly common thing where the boot fits through four weeks of your five-week cycle. And that last week, it's just not, it's hard to get on. It doesn't want to work. So it's very easy to learn how to roll your toe back and your farrier should be happy to show you. If you do encounter rubbing, you know, we kind of have two varieties from break-in and just from poor fit. So again, you know, wearing your new boots too much can lead to rubs, even if they do fit. And this is just because the foot is not accustomed to having a boot on it and the boot has not stretched and broken in where that particular foot needs. Boots need to break in. They need some time. So slight rub marks, but no real injury. So, you know, the hair will be rubbed, possibly rubbed off, but the skin itself is not really damaged. Those types of rub marks usually resolve fine if you just give them the time and are cautious about how much you use the boots until that resolves. And as I mentioned, this is a, a case where the duct tape can work really well. Very often, if you get a little bit of rubbing at the heel bulbs right above the hairline, you know, I'll take just a strip. So we're not going to wrap the duct tape around the foot. We're just going to take a strip of duct tape, anchor it really firmly on the hoof wall lay it gently over the hairline and anchor it firmly on the hoof wall on the other side and then just sort of gently pat it down over the hair we don't want it to stick to the skin so much so you know if the foot's a little bit dusty or something over the hairline that's actually a good thing we just want it to just lightly touch and then the boot can slide over the duct tape instead of rub and that can be real helpful if you know you're halfway through a camping trip and you need your boots and you're starting to see some problems that can be a nice thing to do to just make sure you're not going to progress any further in the rubs but if your horse has developed a sore the skin is oozing you're seeing you know some bleeding or cracking or some sort of you know serum fluid anything like that the boot doesn't fit stop using it a big open sore like that that's not something that you usually can resolve unless it's you know Every so often we can get them to resolve because the issue was, you know, the boot got twisted and the horse was out in turnout and it was twisted in turnout for 20 hours. And so over time that damage happened. But usually if you've got an actual sore starting and not just a little bit of a rub mark, usually the boot does not fit. And you need to stop using boots until the rub heals up completely and then revisit what boot you're going to use. So very often rubbing is a size, shape, design mismatch between the boot and the foot. And it's just, okay, you know, we've got the wrong size or we need to look at a different model to fit this foot better. Sometimes it's easily fixable because, you know, hey, it's the end of the trim cycle, toe's gotten too long, so the back of the boot is being pushed into the heel. Roll the toe back and the boot will start fitting correctly again. So that's an easy fix. But ideally your boot will be the correct shape, size, and design for your horse's foot and the rubbing simply won't be an issue past a little bit of mark through the break-in period. So just because you're getting a tiny bit of rubbing or the rubbing's on the hoof wall itself and not the soft tissue, you know, those usually, if you're cautious about it, will come out fine. But when you do have an actual sore that's happening, you need to stop and you need to protect that foot 
and get it to heal up. And, and this is all speaking towards a horse that's working in boots. If you have a horse who's, you know, laminitic and needs cloud boots, you know, desperately, that's the only thing you could do for them and they're starting to get a rub mark, you know, that's when you go, okay, let's wrap the foot, put it in a diaper or um, use socks or, you know, really get in there and protect the foot up. But that's kind of a different, a different discussion. Awesome. Yeah. I think this is all really great. I, my phone's at 28%. So I, I probably should charge my phone. I think it'll probably die. Well, well have a good rest, have of, a your good rest of your yeah, day. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you <laughs> all right. I'll talk to you later. Sounds good. All right. Bye. Bye. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.